Okay, well, I guess we're going back to the problem fresh here, but that's completely fine. Okay, so again, we're just using the equation, the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. And we'll plug the mass in again, do that conversion one more time. But what I need to do is I need to get this velocity into meters per second, just so I can have the proper conversion into the joule. Okay, so that's kind of why one of the first parts of the problem last time, I was trying to figure out the number of meters per second by starting with the 1,080 miles per hour. And so if I have miles per hour, in fact, let me write this ratio just this way here. So we can kind of see miles on the top, hours in the denominator. And so we're just using the conversion that one mile is 5,280 feet. And we could look this up, or we would have this given on the test. We wouldn't expect everybody would have this conversion factor memorized. Very few conversion factors uh, will we assume that you know. Um, as we start getting closer to midterm one, you'll see that usually we don't give you a big sheet of stuff, but we'll throw some information into problems. When you see practice problems, a lot of times you'll start to see some extra information provided in the problem. If this was a test question, we would have this information here given. We'd even give you that there's 12 inches in a foot. Just again, not everybody is from the US and uses this a lot. So this would be a given conversion factor. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. Again, this would be given. And so we're just trying to get to meters per second. So we've gone from miles to feet, feet to inches, inches to centimeters. And we're just using dimensional analysis. The, the way this works is our miles canceling, our feet's canceling, our inches are canceling. And then we just need you know, to use the 100 centimeters in a meter. So the centi prefix, 100 um, of that unit in the meter. And then the last one that we come to is the seconds in an hour to go from miles per hour to meters per second. And so one hour, and we're putting the hour up top so it cancels, is 60 minutes, 60 minutes times 60 seconds, so that's 3,600 seconds. And so that's how we go from miles per hour to meters per second. And I mentioned this last time, you know, if you're at home doing this conversion, you probably just like throw it into your phone. But this example here is meant to take us through the topic of dimensional analysis to give an example of a unit conversion problem. So you might have, you know, not have access to using Google or some other easier way to do a conversion, say, during a test. So if we throw this into a calculator, we get 483 meters per second. And we just need it in that unit there so that when we go into our kinetic energy equation, we take our 32 grams. We know we need to go over to kilograms to use our unit. This half was extraneous. We had crossed that out last time. It's just one joule is one kilogram meter squared per second squared. So then we're using that 1,000 grams per uh, kilogram to get our kilogram unit. And then multiplying by 483 meters per second quantity squared. So I get 3,070, let's write it this way, 3,729. And the units, you could still think of this as being kilograms meters squared per second squared. But this whole unit here is just one joule. So that would make that 3,729 joules. Now, the question asked for this in kilojoules, not in joules. So we would just do one more conversion, 1,000 joules per kilojoule. It's a lot of joules in one kilojoule. And so that gives us 3.73 kilojoules. Now, rounding sig figs, that's going to come in a few moments. So we're going to start talking about how we know where to round values off. Let's save that discussion for an actual problem once we go through that topic. Um, if you're going to pay attention and come back to this problem, it would end up being three. But we can revisit this in a moment if, if we want to. 
But so let's get into the discussion of some significant figures so we can figure out how do we know when to round, when do we keep two digits versus three versus four, um, when we're dealing with problems that involve inherently, you know, uh, uh, measurements we've taken in the lab or we've imagined we've taken in the lab. So when we start interpreting data given in problems, we're gonna have to start interpre interpreting, you know, the digits that are given to us as being somewhat special. So let's get into this topic of significant figures after we just discuss a couple other units first. And so this slide here, it's meant to talk a little bit about units so we can see some of the prefixes we're gonna wanna know. So on the bigger side of units, we have the kilo, mega, and giga. And so the kilo is the thousand per kilogram. The mega would be the 10 to the six, you know, grams per one megagram. So a mega is meant to imply you have a lot of something, so you have a lot of grams in the megagram. And a gigagram, maybe grams, we don't use with giga a lot, maybe with bits or bytes, uh, but 10 to the nine. So the giga is 10 to the nine. So we got 10 to the three, 10 to the six, 10 to the nine. And then centi we saw is 10 to the minus two, or 100 centimeters per meter. So this is now where the, the centi is a smaller unit. So you can think of your conversion factor one of two ways, 100 centimeters and one meter, or that one centimeter is 10 to the minus two meters. So if we're thinking 10 to the nine, 10 to the six, 10 to the three for giga, mega, kilo, we might be thinking 10 to the minus two for cent centi, 10 to the minus three for milli, so a thousand millimeters and a meter, 10 to the minus six for micro, 10 to the minus nine for nano, 10 to the minus 12 for pico. I put pico here. I don't think I've seen an example in the last five years on a test that uses pico. Occasionally they use nano, but usually we're kind of focusing on some of the more common ones like kilo, centi, milli, uh, maybe micro early on um, in a class like this. But we'll, you'll see a few examples and problems of converting between you know, millimeters and meters or nanometers and meters. There's actually an example coming up for nanometers to meters. So we'll see that example here in a minute. Um, and so then we kind of need to know some of these base SI units. We've mentioned some of these last time in passing, but length is the meter. Mass is actually kilogram. That's kind of why the previous problem, we had the kilogram meter squared per second squared and one joules because the SI unit of mass is the kilogram, not the gram. Uh, quantity would be the mole. We don't talk a lot about the mole until we get into chapter three. Um, so, but that is the SI unit of uh, quantity. Temperature would be Kelvin. You might think it's degree C, but it's actually Kelvin. We'll talk about temperature conversions in a slide or two from now. And time, obviously, in seconds. Uh, there's uh, seven base SI units. That's one, two, three, four, five of them. The um, other two are not so useful for a class like this. One's like luminous intensity. Um, and I forget, I'm blanking on what the other one is. But these are the five kind of key ones that are relevant for a class like this. Um, and so then, oh, the temperature conversion is actually right here. But there's a, a slide on some the, the temperature scales, I think is the next slide. Um, so let's look at the temperature conversions in a slide from now. But th there's some equations here. We'll see them again on, in a slide in a minute. We have a few other uh, derived SI units that are kind of derived off of these fundamental SI units. We saw one already, the energy, the joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Something not in the slide is like, you know, the, um, like force. If you think of like mass times acceleration, acceleration meters per second squared. The SI unit of force has the base SI unit of Newton. So one Newton is one kilogram meter per second squared. Um, and so, uh, so you can almost kind of see like for most of your base SI units or, or your derived SI units some fundamental SI units underneath them. These aren't for necessarily for memorization. This is just kind of trying to see underlying these SI units that we've derived, the fundamental SI units of like kilogram, meters, and seconds. Volume, uh, we tend to think of the liter as a derived unit. One liter is 10 to the minus three cubic meters, so it has a relationship to the meter scale. Um, so a uh, cubic meter, if you had a one meter by one meter by one meter box, that's a pretty big box. That's a thousand uh, liters. One thing with conversion factors like the liters to cubic meters here, 
or like the centimeters to meters, there's always two ways you can give the conversion factor. You can say, well, how many cubic meters are in a liter or how many liters are in the cubic meter? See how there's always two ways? I mean, you could also have infinite number. You could say, well, how many cubic meters are in two liters? And that would be kind of extraneous and kind of get annoying to d define uh, conversion factors that way. But the two common ways you'll see conversion factors written and used is you know, how many of the one unit are in one or the other and vice versa. So you'll see uh, those used. And the, the, the key that you're usually trying to remember is because like if you're on a test sometime, maybe you need to use this conversion factor and you'll forget, is it one liter is a thousand cubic meters? And like you can usually just think that that doesn't make much sense, that a liter is relatively small compared to a cubic meter. Uh, density um, has the base SI units of mass. Well, density is mass per volume, of course. So the base SI unit kilograms per liter. Um, you could see units kilograms per cubic meter. You could see units of like grams per milliliter. You'll see a lot of different units for density, but these would be kind of off the derived units using the base SI units. So you can kind of have some definition or der uh, um, um, sort of use of units within these derived quantities of having some relationship to our fundamental SI units. So I mentioned the slide here, we'd look at temperature. So this slide here is just showing us some of our temperature conversions. So I've really just set the, the uh, scale for the temperatures we tend to work with. Um, so on our Celsius scale, the one probably in science classes you use the most, 100 is your boiling of water, zero is your freezing of water. We know that's, at least if you're from the US, 212 to boil, 32 to freeze. Um, and so those are the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales, how you have 100 degrees in Celsius that spans um, 212 minus 32 degrees in the Fahrenheit scale. And so we have some conversions between Fahrenheit and Celsius. You don't have to memorize these equations. If you need to use one of these on a test, we would give you the equation. And then um, the Kelvin scale is one that we'll use as we get into, I think the first chapter we use this a lot. I think chapter 10 is the first one we start using this equation a lot. This is where we just add 273.15 onto the Celsius temperature. So if you had a temperature in degrees C, say you have 25 degrees C, and you want to convert this to Kelvin, then you would just add 273.15. So the temperature in Kelvin would be equal to 298 Kelvin. So room temperature in degrees C and Kelvin scale would be 298. And so our melting of water, excuse me, our, our um, yeah, melting of water to boiling of water in the Kelvin scale, 273 to 373 Kelvin. Now, the point of the Kelvin scale is that zero Kelvin, which would be minus 273.15 degrees C, is the lowest attainable temperature that's possible. So the, the utility of the Kelvin scales, it sets the lowest possible temperature is zero, such that you can't have a negative temperature like you can in the Fahrenheit and Celsius scale. So it kind of gets rid of the possibility of negative. Really useful in problems where you just want to have temperature be um, never negative. So you don't have to take into consideration the sign flipping in temperature. Um, and so that's the utility of the Kelvin scale is it sets the, the lowest possible temperature as zero in its scale so you, you don't have negative temperatures. So just a kind of question that works through thinking about the scales, which of these temperatures represents the lowest temperature? So you have 25 Kelvin, 25 degrees C, 25 Fahrenheit. Which of those would be the coldest temperature? Um, so just think about that for a minute. You can talk with your neighbor if you want. We'll just spend about a minute on thinking about this one.
Okay, so as you look at these, I mean, we know this is like room temperature, so I think we're pretty well acclimated. 25 degrees C is going to be in the 70s-ish degree C, or in, in Fahrenheit scale. We know this is below the freezing point of water, so we know that it's certainly not going to be 25 degrees C, because 25 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be colder than 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and we could plug in and solve some units. I'll go through one of the conversions of Celsius and Fahrenheit here in a minute. But then the 25 Kelvin is really close to zero, which is going to be really negative in the negative scale. So I think it's pretty clearly going to be 25 Kelvin that's the lowest possible temperature, because you're talking about this being 25 degrees above the lowest possible attainable temperature of minus 273 degrees C. Um, so that's really cold. And so the coldest temperature here is going to be the 25 Kelvin. And if we want to run through just how you convert the degree C, say 25 degrees C into Fahrenheit to see what room temperature is in Fahrenheit. Um, and so we do 25 times 9 fifths plus 32. And then we arrive that that would be 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So room temperature 25 degrees C in Fahrenheit scale would be 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And we saw earlier that's 298 Kelvin. Okay, so just the use of some temperature scales and kind of getting acclimated to where temperatures are on those scales. And I mentioned we do a problem like this here just to kind of show the conversion of different units. And so how many nanometers are there in this number of centimeters? Uh, now let's think about maybe two conversion factors. One is the, the centimeters in a meter. Like this is what we'd have to know like on a test to be able to plug in. And then we have to do the same thing for the number of nanometers in one meter. And so, and it's always mostly about getting the right number. Like nano's nine, but is it 10 to the minus nine nanometers in a meter? Is it 10 to the plus nine? That's usually where you come down to on a test is, is you'll be thinking, is it 10 to the minus nine nanometers in one meter? Or is it 10 to the plus nine nanometers? And if you think of the nanos being small, there has to be a lot of those small things in the big thing. And so it's 10 to the plus 9 nanometers in the meter. And the same thing with the centimeter. Centimeter is also small, so there's a lot of the centimeters in a meter, so that would be the 100. I'll start the problem and go a step or two and let you guys do the final step in calculation to have a, a minute to digest this problem here. But the way I would start the mental analysis problem like this one or the way I would use the mental analysis to solve a problem like this one is I would say, okay, I'm looking for the number of nanometers because that's what we're looking for in the problem. So it's a, you know, if your dimensional analysis begins with what you're looking for, I'll help clue you in on the steps you might use. I'm going to start with what I'm given. So, you know, what we're looking for and what we're given. And then we can apply our conversion factors. And I'm just dividing by the centimeters to cancel out that unit. And then I'm doing like a two-step process to convert over to nanometers. So I'm going to do the nanometer to meter conversion next. Let me let you guys just spend a minute trying to wrap this problem up. Um, maybe even try to throw it into your calculator. Because like oddly, you know, the, if you haven't done scientific notation in a while, sometimes putting it in your calculator is, is fun. <laughs> so let me let you guys spend a minute on this one.
Okay, did anybody get A by any chance? Okay, A, A is, I don't think it's the, let me think, let me look at my, yeah, A is the right answer. Anybody get B? I, I, in my head, I was, it, it is funny when you look at a number, it's like how many zeros are in that? But I'll go through like how we can double check that in a minute. But um, who got B? Anybody get B? Good. Uh, but there's, there's actually an easy way we can put our numbers in wrong in our calculator. So I just want to talk a minute about how we do the scientific notation. Like how do we enter this into the calculator so we correctly get the right answer? So I do 0 0.025 and I divide by 100. That's easy enough. But then it's the times, you know, ten, do we do 10E9? Do we do 10 carat 9? Do we do 1E9? Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is this. And you may be thinking, well, obviously I wouldn't do that. This is 10 times 10 to the 9. So this would be interpreted in your calculator as 10 times 10 to the 9. And that would not be the right notation to enter 10 to the 9. So we're going to want to enter this as either 10 carat 9 or 1 E9. That's the way I usually go because I think it's easier to find. I always never know where the caret button is on my calculator usually. So when I did this problem, I did 0.025 divide by 100 then times 1 E to the 9. Now some of you guys are like, well, no crap, I know this. But you probably did the calculation more recently. Some of you guys maybe took math a couple years ago or chemistry a while ago and maybe just haven't done that you know, sort of calculator step in a while. But this should end up, and I'll do it one more time. 250,000. Now sometimes the answers on a question might be in scientific notation and then you might be like kind of counting over on your calculator like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this would be 2.5 times 10 to the 5. Let me write that out more clearly. So sometimes the answers would be given in scientific notation. Most calculators, depending on your model, have a way of changing into like scientific notation. Like mine, there's a little psi engineering button I can change into scientific notation, and then it'll show me. So on a test, it's actually really useful to be able to switch into scientific notation mode so you don't have to make a mistake in like counting on your screen if you're rushed for time. And then, of course, I just thought back that floating is the kind of normal mode. So you usually have to switch back, otherwise your calculator screen looks kind of weird. Um, so using calculators and not making mistakes with the calculator is obviously useful in a class like this, especially if you haven't done some of these silly calculations in a while. Yes? Um, so think about it this way. So, so one meter is about this length here. Um, and then the nano is small. So there's a lot of the nanometers. So it's 10 to the plus 9 um, nanometers in the meter. We could say one nanometer the little thing would be equal to 10 to the minus 9. So the minus 9 comes up if we use the conversion factor this way. And obviously, if we use this conversion factor, then we're dividing by 10 to the minus 9, which is the same as multiplying by 10 to the 9. So if you forget nano small, just I, what I usually come back to is like, well, what's milli? Everybody knows millimeters usually. And so like nano's on the same side of the coin as nanometer. A lot of millimeters in a meter, a lot of even more nanometers in a, in a meter, and kilo, mega, uh, giga on the other side, where there's um, a lot of the grams in the kilogram, gigagram, et cetera. OK, so let's get into the topic of significant figures, everybody's favorite topic. But it's really just a few set of rules and a little bit of understanding of what it is this is trying to accomplish, and hopefully we can um, understand this topic as well as we can. And so what this starts to get into is all the digits of a measured quantity, including what we call the uncertain digits, are significant figures. What this starts to get into is if you use a balance, let's say you use an analytical balance, you very carefully have these two extra zeros on your balance. I think you guys may have used a balance already in lab. If not, we have these analytical balances that read off the four digits. You could add some mass so you perfectly get 1.2500 grams. This number here would represent a quantity that contains five significant figures. Meaning we have digit one, two, three, four, five. So the most significant down to the least significant digit in that measurement. Now, we often call, or, and you often see this whenever you take a measurement, is that last digit's usually going up and down. You know, so usually that last digit 
on the balance, it's not going to be perfect 1.2500 for always. You're going to see that it's going, you know, 990100, going up and down a little bit. And that's because this is our uncertain digit. It's a digit we have the least certainty in, but we still have some certainty in it. You know, like, we know it's closer to zero in this example than it is, like, five or six or seven or eight. You know, that, like, whoever took this reading would have been interpolating or averaging it out in their mind and ending up at 12500. Zero, zero. And so even though that digit's uncertain, it's not completely lacking uncertainty. It's just that last digit we're reading off the scale. Um, an example I'll do in a minute where it's kind of like the interpolation digit. It's a digit we're interpolating between two other numbers. So when we're rounding calculated numbers, we pay attention to sig figs in these measured quantities so we can know how to round our values and round them with some set of rules so that we're stating our results with the precision we know them to have from the measurements we took them with. You know, it's like if we, if we use a different type of balance, like a top-loading balance, and we determine some object only has 101.25 grams on a different balance, then this digit here only has three sig figs. So if we're using a density, we're trying to find a density of an object using this mass, like we're going to be limited probably to three sig figs with 1.25. We might be able to get up to five sig figs on our density if we use the other value. So it kind of like will lead us to more precise results with more digits on them if we have more precise measurements going into them, less precise measurements, less precise results that we can come up with. OK, so it's, I was going to do a demo online. It's going to be easier to do in person. Um, I think this will help us understand that the, the sort of rules of significant figures will come mostly from the scales that we use and not from the object itself, OK? So whenever we start doing problems, we start to have this like, issue of like, how many digits are, are, are known in the value. It usually comes down to the tool, not the actual object. So you have this object, like how long is this object? And like, imagine you have one ruler on the top that doesn't have a lot of markings. And so we line it up. And what do you guys think the length of that measurement, the, the length of that piece is on that top scale? It's like, it would round to 15, but it's somewhere between 10 and 15. And it's obviously closer to 15. You might be guessing maybe 14, maybe somewhere in that range. You're kind of like, you see how you're guessing in between, like you're interpolating between your scale, and you're guessing probably about 14-ish is probably as good as you could do on the top scale. And then if we use the bottom scale, I'll line it up right. Now you can see that it's a little bit over 14. Okay, we couldn't tell that before. We didn't have enough precision with our measuring tool above to you know, be able to tell if it was 14 or 15. Now that we have a better scale, a better instrument that we're using, if you will, we can now interpolate better and get that this is probably, what do you say, like 14.2 maybe? Or, well, it's kind of funny, on my, something not lined up right. Um, um, when I look at it here, it looks 14.2. When I look at it up here, it looks like 14 and a half. But that's just from the way something's angled. Do you guys see how that's closer to 14.2? But we can agree that somewhere between 14 and 15, and we can maybe, depending on with the scale looks to you, maybe it's closer to 14 and a half, maybe it's closer to 14 and a quarter, somewhere in that range. So we're like interpolating between the one. Then obviously if we use the scale on the bottom, like I can see on my scale, you guys may not agree, but it looks about 14.1, and I keep moving it too, that doesn't help. It's like somewhere between 14.1 and 14.2. And again, you may disagree just because of the angle of the camera. But so depending on the, on, the, on the tools or the scales that we use, we can interpolate better and get more precise results. So I have an object that maybe was 14. Oops, let me switch. So I had an object on scale 1 that was 14, um, looks like centimeters. Scale 2 was 14.2 centimeters. And on scale 3 was 14 point, 
I'll call it 1 pi. It's kind of like right between the, the 1 and the 2 notch. And I can interpolate between and read between the length scale. So we'll see some bit of interpolation in a minute. But that's sort of where you have your scale rating of 0 0.1, 0 0.2. And you can kind of see that your object is in between. And you can start to make some sort of a guess is at point. 2.4.6, etc., interpolating between the scale. And so when you're like disagreeing, when I look at something and think it's 14.15, and you look at it and you think it's 14.13, that shows that this digit here is carrying that uncertainty. That's the one that has some inherent uncertainty that we're interpolating between our scales. And so if we're going to use this number in like the second step of a calculation, then we're going to have more precise results. And if we use this number, then we're going to have a different level of precision with our results. But most things have some actual length. And, and so that kind of, you know, sometimes we get confused with sig figs of, well, is that exactly the length? Well, who knows? You know, the object does have some actual like length. The question is, how well can we ever know it? It depends on what scales we use to determine them. And so let's think about this thought example here. So if I were to look out into the room today, um, I do think it looks like about 300 people are here. I know the room holds like 350 to 360-ish. It's probably 275 if I'm starting to like notice how many empty seats there are. But in my head, I can start to kind of guess or, or sort of estimate how many people there are. So if I, let's say, approximate there were 300 people here, let's say. So there's 300 people in this room. Uh, first, we can obviously take a counter and very precisely count the room. And maybe we could do it two or three or four times so we have certainty in our count, so we know for sure we've counted the proper number. Think about the difference between if, like, um, four people enter the room in those two circumstances. Like, in circumstance one, where we just estimated there were 300 people here, could we claim there was 304 people here? Like, no. Like, there's still approximately 300 people here. If you start to think about it, you have to really think, how well can I really approximate the room, room size, before 10 or 20, would it take 50 people to come in for me to think that there's 350? Would it take, you know, or would I still think, well, there's maybe 275, I rounded the 300, so maybe there's still close to 300. You know, so like, this gets us in the mode of thinking about how well we calculate something. We'd have to precisely know, you know, people are weird, we can count people, you know, like, there's not, there's a difference between one versus half a person, but like, so you're either here or not. So, People are weird and where we can count exact units of them. If we count 300 people, four people come in, obviously there's 304 people in the room then. And we know that for sure. Um, and so when we start seeing numbers, we need to almost like start thinking the ones that have some uncertainty to them, the measured quantities, are the ones that we have to track and very carefully count sig figs and do math with and think about how we round things with. It's not the perfectly counted things that matter. You know, like 12 counted eggs. If I do a problem with like a perfect number like 12, I know I counted, I'm not gonna like round things like two sig figs off that number. That's not gonna really factor into my sig figs. We'll see conversion factors play this way too, where they're either precisely known or, or we can vary, you know, you can look up the pound to kilogram conversion to like 12 digits if you want to use it very precisely. So there are things that are very precise or exact, like we can count eggs. So this is an exact quantity. So if I ask, like, how many sig figs does 12 counted eggs represent, the answer would be, like, infinity. That this would have, like, an infinite number of sig figs, not two. Like, sig figs comes into play where we have, like, an uncertain digit. There's no uncertain digit. I'm not, like, did I count 13? Did I count 11? No, I'm certain I counted 12. I count something, I know there's 12. But whenever I see some sort of ordinary lab measurement, I'm like assuming that somebody used the device that they were interpolating that last digit on, and then that last digit carries some uncertainty. So because 105.0 is an ordinary lab measurement, I can look at that last point zero and say that must be the uncertain digit in this uh, measured quantity that's being told to us. And then I interpret this value here to have one, two, three, four sig figs. So by locating the uncertain digit is what cues me in to this being a measured quantity and one that's subject to these sig fig counting rules. And then I count that uncertain digit plus all the other digits in the quantity as being significant. Now if I have 0 0.0305 grams of sucrose, I, uncertain digit would be the last digit in that measured quantity. And then here I only have three digits that are significant. So I have three sig figs here, 
Now, why do the zeros not count, do you think? They're just like placeholders. You know, if I were to write this number in scientific notation, I'd write 3.05 times 10 to the minus 2 grams. And I should agree in the sig figs. Now, you can say, well, what about the number above, the 1.05? If I write this in scientific notation, I'm just going to make sure I grab that last zero. And then times 10 to the uh, 2 liters. So I can use scientific notation and get the same sig figs as long as I kind of keep the zeros that were significant to begin with. So now a zero, like after a decimal, it wouldn't have been written if it wasn't significant. So it has to be significant after a decimal place. If I do one more example, what if I say 1,080 miles per hour, like in that first example? Like this zero is a little hard to interpret. Like did the scale really read off zero and it could have given me 1082 if it were 1082? Or is this just rounded to the tens placeholder and this is some measurement that was only precise to three digits? I usually assume that the zero is insignificant if I don't have more information. So if I don't have more information, I'm usually not assuming that this is a significant digit and my uncertain digit is this eight. It would be better if somebody used scientific notation to give me this number. If somebody had used 1.08 times 10 to the 3 miles per hour, then that would be unambiguously 3 sig figs. But I'm going to interpret 1080 in most problems to be 3 sig figs, unless I know something about that zero. Sometimes you might see this decimal written. Sometimes we do this in our lab notes, and that's OK, because it's kind of like telling us that that zero is significant because I wrote the decimal point. Um, on tests or something, usually we don't have written tests. But if we had a written test, I would say use scientific notation if you wanted to express that number with four sig figs, because it would just be 1.80 uh, miles per hour to signify that quantity with four sig figs instead of three. So I'd probably say 1,080 without that decimal, just three sig figs. So the, the sometimes we call it a trailing zero is usually only significant if there's a decimal point, and that zero is after the decimal point. Now, burette readings are something that we do a lot in lab where we can do some interpolation, or we can sort of like you know, use our eyes the best we can to see our scale. First off, we have 19 to 20. These are 10th units here. So we can clearly see that it's 20.0. I think we can agree that it's 20.0. But do you guys agree with me that we can actually add one more zero on? You know, and the, why, the reason why we can add one more zero on is if that meniscus fell like right here instead of where it is, couldn't we agree that that's probably like 20, or that actually be 19, 19.98? Yeah, so like if we had this meniscus here, wouldn't this probably be 19.98? So can't we interpolate that extra zero by the fact that it's right on the scale? Okay, and so then if we have a meniscus in a different situation that's down here, like, can't we agree that that's probably 20.06? And if you're thinking, well, maybe I would say 07, then you kind of get the point, that there's some, a little bit of uncertainty, but we're we know it's closer to 6 than it is like 2 in the 20.06 example. Then it's like over, well, maybe we don't know that. It, you know, it's somewhere in the 20 point, actually, now I look at it again, I'd probably say it's 20.04 or 03. But do you see how we can agree that it's not 20.09? We can agree. So we can have some uncertainty if we're going to write 03 or 04, but we can probably say it's not 01 or it's not 09. So we have a little bit more certainty, but still some uncertainty. OK, so now let's put this into practices. Like the first, like when we start doing problems, we have to identify, well, are these numbers in this problem representative of ordinary lab measurements that are subject to these rules of sig figs? You know, like if you have 100 counted eggs and, and I give you four more eggs, you have 104, right? But if you have 100 approximate eggs and I give you four more, you still have 100. So the rules of sig figs come in when we have measured quantities that are subject to these rules. If we have perfect numbers, if we just have numbers, we're not changing math, we're not changing arithmetic. This has nothing to do with arithmetic. This all has to do with the inherent impreciseness of these measured quantities that we're interpreting in problems. So let's look at a couple of rules. Um, for dealing with calculations involving these quantities. So it's almost always going to be that least certain measurement or inexact quantity that limits the significant figures in the result. 
So if you have you know, an object you very carefully measure the mass of and some other object that you crudely know the mass of, you add them together, obviously it's gonna be that crude object that really limits the precise precision of your results. So we add or subtract. Um, the results are gonna be reported to the same decimal place. Sometimes this is better thought of as the placeholder than decimal place. Um, like, some students disagree with me. Like, if you say 1,080 miles per hour, is this a decimal place? Because I think it still is. Maybe the word placeholder makes more sense. But we're going to report the results to the same decimal place or placeholder as the value with the greatest value decimal place you know, or placeholder. And so if we're looking at like this, this is a greater quantity placeholder than say if I wrote a different number, let's say 1,080.00 miles per hour that if we're comparing the last significant digit in these values, that this is a lesser placeholder and this is a greater placeholder. So we're gonna round to that greater placeholder would make more sense because that's where our uncertainty is ending with that particular number. And so we have an addition example, so let's apply the addition rule real quick before looking at the multiplication rule. And so if I'm adding 1.2505 grams to 4.4140 grams, the thought here is two different scales, like we use two different balances to get these masses. You know, that's why one of them only has two digits after the decimal and the other one has four. So I think that's like one helpful thing is understanding that when you start doing problems that if you have, uh, you know, mass quantities that end in different placeholders, we just use a different tool. And using a less precise tool kind of probably said, why did we bother using the more precise tool for the other mass? Because when we go to add these two quantities together, it's this greater placeholder of the five that we're gonna round to. So I do the math here, and I get 129.4640, that we're gonna round to that same placeholder, that hundredth placeholder, that's the greater quantity placeholder in the two measurements that we're adding together. So we're adding together two mass quantities, two ordinary lab measurements. We're rounding to the placeholder, so we get 129.46 grams as our answer. Now we can exemplify this too. If you look at 75 plus 75 of what we kind of mean here, like these digits here, this is a different mass tool altogether. Maybe this is, remember we added a little mass weights onto like a balance. You remember doing that in science class probably in seventh grade or something. And so if, if all you had were whole number grams, and, and you knew something was 75 grams, you had 75 grams, you get 150. This is actually 150 grams out to that third significant figure. Why is that? Well, think about 175, like our uncertainty. It's almost like we're doing some stats here. Has anybody taken stats? Maybe some upperclassmen have taken stats. Like, if you take a stats class, you probably do the arithmetic. Well, what if you have 75 plus or minus one, and you add to it 75 plus or minus one? Don't you imagine you get 75 plus 75 to 150 plus or minus probably like two? or somewhere in that range, so you might be looking at this going, okay, if we take a stats class, we can actually figure out how to do the arithmetic of our uncertainties and add them up and, if you will, propagate them through the problem, and you'd probably agree that we have three significant figures with some inherent uncertainty in them still in that uncertain digit. So the uncertain digit is coming in that third placeholder, and so we might write this 1.50 times 10 to the two grams to exemplify having three sig figs on that result. Now, sometimes, like if you just throw this into a calculator, <laughs> this is silly. I just want the number in the calculator, though. Then when the calculator says 150, a lot of people say, well, that's, I thought you said, if you see 150, that that's two sig figs, and we don't assume that that zero is significant. But this is a case where we know something about the zero. So we know something about the zero. We've added 75 to 75. It's good to the same placeholder, the ones placeholder, in the value, and that's where we're gonna to round to, or that's where we're going to know the result significant out to, in this case, three sig figs. So sig figs isn't always about rounding, sometimes it's about knowing when zeros are significant or not in a problem. So we'll see a few examples of that here in a minute, of just knowing when we should add some zeros on. And then this next uh, subtraction problem, so we have subtraction two in the addition and subtraction rule, is we're looking at placeholders. So we're gonna round this result to the hundredth placeholder. Um, 
Looks like it's gonna come out to be 20.01 grams. And so all four of those digits are going to be significant. So we have four significant figures. Now, when I do the addition subtraction rule, I'm not like counting sig figs in the one number and the other and rounding based on the counting of sig figs. It's all about the placeholders. It's all about hundreds place minus hundreds place. I round to the hundreds place. And then I keep all the digits and the value to that point. So four sig figs for that subtraction step. Now, when we think about multiplying and dividing, before we look at the rule, let's almost like think about how it's really the plus or minus one that plays out here. Like, you know, th think about how that uncertainty really like tracks in, say, a multiplication step. Like, if, if one of the values is 75 and the other one is, actually happens to be 74, so think about doing 75 times 74, 75 times 75, and then 75 times 76, and kind of see how that plus or minus one is changing the result. And so 75 times 75 is 56, 25. 75 times one lower is 55, 50. And then 75 times 76 is 5,700. So do you guys see how, like the multiplication, do you see how it's this digit here that's changing? That it's like, if I'm off by one, that's inherently where this impreciseness is coming from, is that fact, then when I have 75, I have that uncertainty. It could be 74, it could be 76, somewhere in that range, that if I do 74 times 76, I get 5,500-ish, 5,700 if I'm one over. So it looks like, doesn't this look like the value should have two sig figs? Would you agree that two digits are significant in 75 times 75? When I look at the rule, when multiplying or dividing, the results are reported with the same number of significant figures as the value with the fewest sig figs in that multiplication step. So two sig figs times two sig figs should have two sig figs. And so 5625 gets rounded to that second sig fig. So that would be 5600 um, meters squared. So I'd report this result here to be 5,600 square meters. Doesn't mean 75 times 75 isn't 5,625. It just means when it's 75 meters times 75 meters. Some inherent lab measurements, we would report the result of that step as being 5,600 square meters with two sig figs. If we want to be unambiguous, maybe we go 5.6 uh, uh, without the zeros times 10 to the 3 square meters. So multiplication and division, we're counting sig figs. Now looking back at the addition and subtraction rule, the first thing I see a lot is once people learn, once students learn the multiplication division rule, they want to go back and count sig figs in the multiplication or in the addition problems. We're not counting sig figs. If I counted sig figs here, I would have rounded 150 to two sig figs, but it's really three. Think about the plus or minus one example we did for the 75 times 75 when we do addition instead. If we do 75 plus 74, 75 plus 75, 75 plus 76, do you see how we're, we're going from 149, 150, 151? Which digit is the uncertain one? The one in the 150, the five in the 150, or the zero in the 150? The uncertainty is coming in the zeros placeholder in that third sig fig. So you can kind of almost derive, if you will, the sig fig rule. You just think of the same number added to itself. Think about the plus or minus one. Think about the same number multiplied by itself. Think about the plus or minus one. And you'll more or less see the rule out in front of you if you consider that arithmetic. And so this is just showing us here that you should get 150 with three sig figs from this math, like we got above. And now the hardest part is really multi-step problems. We have to... Um, we have to like carry the steps out sequentially as we did them mathematically. I mentioned this, I think, on the first day of class. Like, when it comes to sig figs, it's all about order of operations. It's like when we add the numbers here, we have to apply the addition rule. So if I do 7.5 plus 2.6, how many sig figs should that addition step have? It's 10.1. Is that the right answer? Is that the right number of sig figs that the addition should have? 
tenths place plus tenths place should go to tenths place, and it just happens to have three sig figs. Yeah, so this is, this is right here, should have three sig figs. And then I divide by three sig figs milliliters, so I divide 10.1 by 4.55, and I get 2.22 grams per milliliter. And that would be the proper answer to three sig figs because I have three sig figs divided by three sig figs, I result in three significant figures. Now, inherently, like, some people will look at it and say, well, but there's two sig figs in the addition step. Shouldn't I round to two when I divide? But when we add the two numbers together, we get to 10.1 grams to three sig figs. So it's all about how that addition step gained us an extra significant figure. Okay, so we get to keep three sig figs in our result. Um, I just want to take a peek at What's to come? Let's actually look at this question here. Which of these results, let's just look at this one together. Which one of these is more precise? Or are they the same precision? So this one is more precise. So these have different precision. So the more digits we know in a number, the more precise it is. Like, who knows the speed of light? Who thinks they know the speed of light to the most digits? Does anybody know a bunch of them? So it's like 2.9979. And there's like three or four others that are known times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And so um, the more digits we know, the more precise we know, the word would be preciseness, as opposed to accuracy. So we'll start with this difference between what we mean by precision and accuracy, do a few more examples of sick figs, wrap up dimensional analysis, and head into chapter two on Wednesday. All right, guys, thanks for the attention. Thanks for coming today. I'll see you on Wednesday.